Thank you, Jeff. What a wonderful time of worship. Somebody would have to pinch me to reach that note he just reached right there. That was, uh, that was pretty powerful stuff there, Jeff. Thank you. And what a great lyrics. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And what? Some things, all things will be added unto you. So we welcome you again today. If you're uh, here in worship service or online joining us for worship, we're so glad that you are here or you are there and tuning us in, and it's a great day to be in the house of the Lord, a great day to study his word, to be encouraged, to have your burdens lifted. Many of you are carrying heavy, a heavy load today, and I just remember Jesus in Matthew 11 that his burden is easy and his yoke is light, so we pray that there'll be a divine transference, that you'll transfer all of your, your weight over to him and let him carry that and let him encourage you uh, today. Today we're going to look at at a message out of the book of Acts, imagine that, Acts chapter 20, but we're really going to zero in on just one passage of scripture. Last week we looked at it briefly, but today I just want to camp out on Acts chapter 20 and look with you at verse 35 in a message entitled, The Blessed Life. If I were to poll you, if I were to ask you, would you like to have a blessed life? And you would, all of you would respond a resounding, absolutely, I want my life to count I want my life to be blessed, and I want my life to be even more blessed in all the realms that that would include, all right? A healthy marriage, a healthy family, a healthy uh, bank account, a healthy uh, outlook on life, a healthy church, a healthy business. Yes, I, I, I crave that. I desire uh, a blessed life. And so today, I'm going to give you the, really the key to how you and I can experience the life that Jesus wants us to experience, a life that can be uh, categorized as nothing short of blessed. Now, let me make sure I'm understanding you correctly, Pastor. You're preaching on money today, right? Yes, that's what I'm preaching. I'm preaching on money, stewardship, finances. It's too late for you to hit the door. You're here, right? You you can't escape. I mean, you can, but everybody will go, oh, he didn't want to hear that sermon, right? And that, that usually is the, the reaction. You get one of two reactions whenever the pastor preaches a whole sermon on stewardship. First you get, and I've already heard this, it's about time. I, yeah, yeah, see, thank you, thank you. It's about time. You, you need to preach on money. Pastor, you need to preach on stewardship and how we are to give uh, our tithes and our offerings. That's exhibit A, reaction number one. Reaction number two is, that's all he talks about is money. I tell you, I went to church, Went to church one time, and that's all I heard was a whole sermon uh, on on money. You know, I was witnessing to a guy um, just last month. I was on the airplane. I was coming back from Kentucky. I was preaching there at a conference, and and I was sitting next to him, and for the entire flight uh, from Louisville to, I think it was Dallas, we talked, and I listened probably 85% of the conversation, which is hard for me. Uh, just to listen, just to be quiet and, and, and to listen. And so I listened to him share about his life, his uh, work, his fascinating job about water purification. And it was, I learned a lot. And then I tilted the conversation towards spiritual matters. We started talking about church and religion and Jesus. And he goes, well, I can tell you right now why we don't go to church anymore. And I was like, really? That, that, I've, I've I've touched a nerve here. And he said, yeah, I'm gonna give you two stories. Last month on the airplane, he gave me the two following stories. He said, first of all, I was in a church one time and they took up the offering. And he thought, well, that's, that's normal. That's what you Christian people do. Y'all take up, take up the offering. And then a lady in the congregation walked up to the pulpit with a piece of paper and gave it to the pastor. And the pastor took the piece of paper and he looked at it Then he looked at the congregation and he just scolded them. He said, this is awful. How dare y'all give an offering that paltry, that small, take it up again. And so the people had to give another offering. And he was sitting there and he was seething with anger. He was just so mad. And then he told me the next story. He said, there was a little lady in a church and she was a widow lady and she didn't have a whole lot of money, but she gave what she could. And in this church, they kept a very close tabulation and record of what you gave. And the pastor called the little widow lady into his office and and he said, I've noticed that you've fallen behind on your giving. You are going to hell. 
That's where you're going because you have fallen behind on your tithes and your offerings. And that's what this, the guy sitting next to me, say, you're making this up. No, I'm not making this up. He literally sits there and he's mad and he's angry. And here's what I did. I said, well, first of all, let me, let me share this with you. I apologize. I apologize that there are idiots in my profession who would do something like that and say something like that. And you might be surprised that 99% of pastors would do, do not do that. You know how the devil does? He just whispers to people, they're all like that. They're all into greed and covetousness and, and money, so you might as well just reject Christianity and don't even, don't even think. And that what's so sad is we often, in, in, in many places in our life, we let the mistakes of a few harm the good of the many. I remember Dr. Roy Fish in our seminary class in evangelism, he was talking about um, police officers. And he said, class, you know, we, we hear excuses all the time of why people don't receive Christ. There are hypocrites in the church, and there are. You know, they, all they talk about, all they want about is your money, and, and we hear that, and so forth and so on. And he goes, you know, let, let me ask you a question, class. If you were to see one of Fort Worth's finest, I mean, in his uniform, and you were to watch him, and he goes underneath a bridge, and he can't see, but you're watching him, and he looks this way, and he looks this way, and he does a drug deal with somebody under the bridge. And the police officer takes the money and tucks it in his bag, and, and he walks off. And obviously, he's done something illegal. He's done something that he should not have done. He said, let me ask you something. The next time you're in trouble, are you going to refuse to call the police because of what that one person did? You say, well, well, well of course not. In every profession, whether it's banking or pastors or plumbers, whatever it is, you're going to have people who are not totally honest. And so in that, instead of that derailing you or hurting you, just say, you know, that is the exception. That's not the rule. And that's the way it is uh, with finances. I, I can't remember the last time I preached an entire sermon on giving. And really, I, I, I should do it more. But well, the beautiful thing about preaching the Bible is you'll preach everything God wants you to preach on, including Stewardship. So let's go there. Let's talk about it. Stewardship could be the missing link in your Christian walk with God. It really could. Now, being a good steward of your time, of your resources, of your finances, giving back to God what he has so graciously and kindly given to you, and in that process of being a good steward, whether it's your tithes, your offerings, your singing in the choir, part of your your uh, worship to the Lord, or, or just being a person of generosity, that could be the missing link of why you're not experiencing the blessed life. Now, here's the way Jesus put it. And then Paul, first of all, says, I have shown you in every way. And the context of our text today is money, okay? Paul has been working with his hands, and he has been providing for people who are associated with him, his missionary colleagues. He said, I have shown you by my example in every way that I have labored like this, and that you also, church, you must support uh, the weak. And this is Paul speaking to the Ephesian elders on his third missionary journey. It's about AD 57. He's making a beeline out of the Aegean Sea right into uh, the, the, go to Jerusalem. But he stops there in Ephesus and he's talking to these pastors. And then he says, remember the words of Jesus. Remember the words of the Lord Jesus that he said, and here it is, it is more blessed to give than it is to receive. Everybody wants to be blessed, but how would you like for God to more bless you? And the key, Jesus said, is to be a giver and not a, a receiver. Ashley and I, I go on record, I wanna share this, we tithe, we, we give our tithes, and Ashley and I live by the principle, and then some. We, have, we started tithing 36 years ago. We first got married, and we tithed on a, I mean, it was a little, but, but praise God, we were able to, to, to do that. Um, I think about Miss Judy Stone. I love her quote when she talks about money. She says, I have never regretted something that I gave away to God. If you, I will show you people that, that are happy, that are joyful, that they get this principle of stewardship, being a good steward, of what God has graciously and kindly given to them. So I got two questions for you today. 
The first question is, what did Jesus really mean when he said, it is more blessed to give than to receive? Now, on the surface, you would think that's not right because that does not make sense. How, how could you be more blessed with less? How could you be more blessed in giving than you are receiving? You're talking about counterculture. You're talking about a totally different way of viewing life, viewing your possessions, viewing the, the way you treat others. Jesus said, mark it down. You will be more blessed if you give than you receive, and I want us to, to talk about that. The second question I have for you today is this. If you are a receiver, how can you turn the tables and become a giver? You know, there, there really are two types of people in the world. There are people, like, like in Proverbs, it says the leech has two daughters, give and give. That, that's what the leech says. Some of you are more leechy in your Christianity than you are being generous. I don't know about y'all, but I love this whole principle of generosity. And Jesus is so right. He's always right. When you have a lifestyle of giving and blessing others, who gets the more, the more joy? I think about even in my own life, even in, in my own family. Uh, you know, when you, when you give a gift to, to somebody and you think, well, this is, um, and just thinking of an example, I don't have peace from the Lord to give you the whole example, but recently I gave something uh, from me that cost me a, a good deal. Not, not so much in money, but, but it cost me in time and energy and effort. And I laid it out before a, a couple of church members and I said, you, you choose and you receive it. And they did. And they took it and the look on their faces and the joy in their eyes, I'm reminded of the words of Jesus. What you just experienced right there, that is true joy. It is true. It is more blessed. I live a more blessed and prosperous and joyful life as I give of my possessions than when I'm hoarding and when I'm coveting and where I'm just wanting more and more and more. Do y'all believe it? Do y'all believe Jesus is telling the truth? that it really is a more blessed state of living uh, to give than it is to receive. Some of you are hesitant. Some of you are like, I'm not so sure. I, I agree. I'm not so sure if that's, um, if that's in the Bible. Well, it is. And I'm going to give you some verses that talk about being blessed, all right? Here's the first one. Honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first fruits of all of your increase. So your barns will be absolutely empty. And you will be destitute, and you will be poor, and you will be just miserable. Is that what the Bible says? It says no. It says honor God with your possessions. That would include, I think, a bare minimum of tithing. And with the first fruits of your increase, don't give God your leftovers. Give God your very best. And here's the promise. Here's the more blessed promise. Your barns will be filled with plenty, and your vats will overflow with new wine. So there's a condition there. Do what God says to do, and then watch what God will do in your life. Okay, let me give you another one. There is one that scatters, yet increases the more, and there is one who withholds more than is right, but that leads to poverty. Did y'all catch that? There is one who scatters, saying, I'm going to be a person of generosity. I'm just going to be a person who gives and blesses others. I'm not worried about what's coming back to me, what's, what the return is going to be on me. I just want to be a blessing, God. I want to be a good steward of what you have given me, and I want to help people. I don't know if y'all do this, or not, but you know, when you go to a restaurant and, and you tithe uh, uh, or you double tithe, that's interesting. We give the waiters and the waitresses twice as much as we give God. I don't know about that. I'm, I'm still thinking about that 20% that you give to the... Y'all do give 20%, right? Well, I don't know, Brother Danny. Where's the exit? Let's get out of here, you know? Look... You know, one guy says, a person of integrity is somebody who gives 20% when they got bad service. Or, or to integrity, or that's some, somebody that wants to do the right thing, even though the person may not. Look, I try to witness to waiters and, and waitresses, and I try to bless them and, and pray over them and give them a, a, a double tithe, you know, a, a 20%. And so what about when you go to the hotel? Anybody travel to the hotel recently? Do y'all leave any money behind for the person who will clean up your room after you're gone. 
Some of you are like, well, no, I don't do that. I paid for that $150 when I gave, when I paid, when I for the room. I'm not going to leave anybody any money. Hey, can I encourage y'all to do that? I love doing that. I'm sure the, 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 the people who clean up the rooms going, oh no, they forgot their money. Too bad, I'm gonna put it in my pocket. No, no, that was not an accident. I wanna live a life of generosity. Do you buy people coffee that are behind you? Do you buy people food in the line behind you? Just try to adopt this lifestyle where you're saying, Jesus, I'm trusting you on this, that it is more blessed. I'm telling you, I get plumb excited when I get to give and bless other people. You say, well, why do you do that? Do you do that because you're wanting God just to bless you? No, I do that because that's the life that Jesus says he will bless. It's more blessed if you give rather than if you're always worrying about receiving. Ooh, verse 25. Is this not an amazing passage? The generous soul will be made rich. That's what it says. And he who waters will also be watered himself. You know, I didn't make this up. I am certainly not a prosperity preaching pastor. Can I, can I get a witness from y'all that I am not that? Is that true? Is that true? Okay, thank you. Y'all have heard me preach the Bible for 12 years. I despise prosperity gospel. Prosperity gospel would say something like, well, y'all need to be given and given so that I, as the pastor, can get more and more and more. And by the way, as you give more and more to the church and bless me, well, then God's really, really going to bless you. And here's my handkerchief, and let me sneeze on it. I mean, let, let me pray over it and send it to you and, and just put this, put this little apron, put this little handkerchief on your heart, and God will bless you when you give. I pray God strike me dead if I ever accept that kind of mentality that says, oh, look, look what I can do. Look how I can prosper. Look, look, what I can, look how I can build my castles and build my, my bank account on your... Mm, mm, mm. God strike me dead. If I ever develop that kind of mentality of hoarding and just prosperity. No, I'm talking to y'all today about being faithful, being a good steward and saying, God, it is, I'm trusting you, Lord. I want to give and bless others instead of just what I can accumulate and build a bigger barn. The generous soul will be made rich and he who waters and just gives will himself be watered and, and blessed. Oh, here's the next one. Some of y'all are like, oh, please don't bring up Malachi 3.10. I just don't like that verse. Why is that verse even in there? Why can't we take it out? Aren't you glad it doesn't teach that in the New Testament? You're wrong. The Bible teaches tithing in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. Jesus commended them for, he said, you give your tithes and your offerings, and that is a good thing, and you should. But don't neglect the weightier matters of the law, like justice and mercy. But anyhow, it's in there, right? Here he comes. Bring your tithes to the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. I, you know, what's interesting. One, one of the reasons I'm, I'm glad I get to tithe it's because Jeff and Lori have a lot of kids, and they need to eat. How many kids y'all have? Five? My tithe, your tithe, is what provides them food and clothing and a, and a salary. Did y'all know that? So that's not true, because y'all have a money tree on the back of the parking lot. And whenever you get low on money, you just go pluck it off of that tree, and you give it to your staff. No, 27 full-time staff. That's what we have here at Great Hills. And that's how we eat, that's how we live, that's how we dress ourselves, that's how we drive our vehicles, that's how we pay our taxes, is because the people of God at Great Hills Baptist Church give their tithes. Those of you that don't tithe, you must not want me to eat. I'm, I'm, I'm just saying, that he says, bring their tithe into the storehouse of the Lord, that there may be food in my house. And try me now in this, come now. The only time in the Bible where God says, test me, test me in this. Test me now in this, and if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. Now, God's either lying or God's telling the truth. I'm not gonna ask you to raise your hand because it would, it would absolutely astound you at the number of people who do not practice simple biblical 
tithing, where you make $100, you give 10 uh, to your local church. And that's the way Ashley and I do it. And then, and then some. I mean, Ashley, my goodness. She, is, for a while there, it was like, oh, I need to tell you something. I'm like, oh, goodness. What, what are we telling me today? Well, there's another ministry we're going to support. I was like, okay, well, who's it? I mean, how many Franklin Grahams are there out there? And how many of these ministries are there? And Ashley says, well, tunnels to towers and, and these ministries and overseas and here at the house and everywhere. And I'm just like, praise God. It's his. It's all his. Why don't I just take it and say, Lord, thank you for it. And let's just give it up. And you know what? God has blessed us. God continues to bless us over and over and over. And I believe it's, it's because his word is, is true. Can I give you one more? You're like, oh, this is killing me. It's killing me. Hey, I was going to save this for later. Let, let, me, let me ask you something. If biblical tithing makes you uncomfortable, Does me talking about baptism make you uncomfortable? Does me talking about being unforgiving make you uncomfortable? Well, it could be. You may not be right with the Lord. Because if you can't obey God in some simple, basic things, how in the world is God going to entrust you with other things? In fact, that is a quote from Jesus. I'm gonna show you this in the Bible in just a few minutes. Jesus said, if I can't trust you with money, how am I going to entrust you with more important things? Some of y'all are like, that's not true. That's not in the Bible. But it is. Here's the thing. God says, give, give. Be generous, be generous. Why? Because God is broke, right? God has no money. And God is like, oh, angels, how am I going to feed y'all if they don't give us their money? No. God says, give, be generous, be a conduit, receive it, and bless other people. Why does God need it? No, nope. you need it. You need the obedience. You need the faith. You need the trust in God. And when you trust in God with your finances, I'm not making this up, y'all. When you trust God with your finances, it's like God says, well, I have your heart now. Where did that come from? Jesus said, for where you're treasure is, there your heart will be also. Never got so many few amens in all my life, but that's all right. You know, we're going to be faithful, right? We're going to be faithful to the Lord. Give, and it will be given to you, Jesus said. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together. You ever bagged leaves? You ever bagged a leaf? You put it in there, and it's just full until you what? Push it down, push it down so that what? If I lost my mind, no. What is Jesus saying here? Give, and it'll be given back. It'll be given back. It'll be pressed down and overflowing as you give. And here's the, here's the kicker. To the degree or the measure that you give will be the measure back to you. I've yet to meet a Christian who always has a hard time paying their bills, never has nothing to give, who practiced biblical tithing. And one more. 2 Corinthians 9, 7, So let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves what? A cheerful giver. So we're going to have a... Somebody say hello. Um, Four weeks from today, we'll have our harvest offering. I love, this is like one of my favorite times of the year. My favorite Sunday is, is the one with the missions, the first Sunday in December, where we just celebrate all that God is doing in missions through Great Hills. And we have our harvest offering. We come to the altar, we put our offerings on the altar. And it's, it's like one of my favorite Sundays. I mean, I just almost weep as I see people just come with joy the Bible says, don't come if your heart's not in it, because God loves a cheerful giver. So to answer this question, why or how in the world is it more blessed if I adopt this lifestyle than if I were to constantly be gaining, obtaining, absorbing? How, how is this? Here's what I call it, y'all. I just call it God's mathematics. God can bless you and use you on 90%, and 
more than 100%. I, I don't understand how that works. It's just I can testify over and over again because every good gift, he says in James 1.17, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, comes down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. I, tell, I meet people sometimes, they get mad. They say, God didn't give me this. I gave me this. Then I just want to ask you a question. Who gave you the brain to think and to process things? Who put a tongue in between your lips so that you could prosecute a case or make an argument or teach a lesson? Who put these hand, who put these fingers together? I mean, you look at a hand. Isaac Newton said a man could only look at his thumb and declare there is a God. Just, just on a thumb, right? A thumb. Who gave us this? Everything is from the Lord. He gives it to us generously, abundantly, and he asks us to be conduits of his grace and our possessions and give to others and bless others and see what God would do in return. I think we're most like God when we are giving. For God so loved the world that he what? That he gave his only begotten son. Whoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. It is in the heart and the very nature of God to be generous and to give. It is a blessing to receive. I'm not gonna debate that, right? It is a blessing to receive. Everybody likes to receive. I don't know about y'all, when I get a Christmas gift or if I get a bonus or if I get something, I'm not gonna say, oh, it's okay, just take it back to Target or just take it back to wherever you got. I wanna say thank you very much. I, I appreciate that, I, I receive that. But here's something better. To be able to give brings me a deeper sense of satisfaction and joy than any gift I've ever received. I can't explain it. It's just that's the way God designed it. So how does one become a giver and not only a receiver? How can you move out of the receive motif into a a giving motif. Well, I want to try to help you with this. I've got a few things I want, to, I want to share with you. Again, I know the math doesn't add up. I know that you, you would think, but I know that I can do more on 100% than I can on 90%. Here's the thing that Ashley and I have discovered. As we've tithed and give our offerings, and by the way, we give to Great Hills Baptist Church way more than a tithe. Whenever Deva sends those end-of-the-year statements for your tax purposes, Ashley and I, we look at that and go, glory to God. I know I did not make that much money at Great Hills Baptist Church, but we were able to give over and above. You say, why would you do that? Well, here's why I would do that. I love my church. I love what God is doing in our church. I love our staff. I love the fact that I get to provide for our staff. I love sitting in an air-conditioned room, just to be honest with you, on a Sunday morning. I like when the lawn care is taken care of. I like all of those things. And I also love the fact that thousands and thousands of dollars were given just to Great Hills Baptist Church members in benevolence. And guess who received the most of that? Our elderly. I love that Great Hills is given 8% of undesignated offerings to missions. I love that you can add probably, I think, Kurt, we were counting up, how much was it, the percentage on the finance committee Wednesday night? 12, at least 12% that Great Hills Baptist Church gives just to missions, okay? Not to mention all the other ministries and opportunities. Ashley and I, in a couple of weeks, we're about to sail on over, fly on over to a dark, dark place on this planet. And when we arrive there, we give, Great Hills Baptist Church gives more money per month to that one country, that one place of darkness than anybody else in the entire world. We do. That's your church. That, that is my church. I love the fact that Great Hills Baptist Church is a generous, giving church. Now, the millennials and the Gen Xers are like, no, we don't give to churches. We give to causes. nitwit. Let me talk to you for a minute. Really? Really? Yeah, we, we give to causes. We don't give to churches. 
those things that I just listed, are those not good causes? <laughs> yeah, but that's the church. Yeah, the church is God's big idea. And when we're faithful to his church and when we give our tithes and our offerings, here's the thing. If you can't tithe to Great Hills Baptist Church because you don't believe in it, then go somewhere else. Find you a church that you're like, that's a church that is really making a difference. And I'm gonna give my money there because they're given to missions and they're given to the poor and they're given to overseas. And I'm, I submit to you, we're doing all of those things. It, it would really shock you. I think it would shock you. And by the way, you can talk to Dava, our accounting. She's our director of finance at Great Hills Baptist Church. You can talk to Matt Worrell, who's the chairman of our finance committee. I mentioned Kurt Summers, Lisa Hall, all these people on the finance committee. We just shake our heads sometimes. Like Wednesday night, we just kind of had a little party at 9 o'clock in my office going, glory to God. Look what God has done in our church and how he desires to do even more. All right. I don't know about y'all, but I am thirsty. Phil, can you give me a cup of water there? It's very biblical. In Jesus' name, you'll not lose your reward, all right? All right, thank you very much. That's a good arm there. I'm gonna give you five ways that you can become a giver instead of just a receiver and position yourself so that you can be more blessed, okay? Number one, remember everything comes from God. If you'll remember that, everything comes from God then it'll put you in the posture of being grateful to God and being able to be a generous person. Here's that passage of scripture that gets to me and it's probably gonna bother you too. Luke 16, 11, Jesus said, if you are untrustworthy about your money, who is going to trust you with true riches? That is not in the Bible. Yes, it is. Jesus, by the way, had a lot to say about hell and a lot to say about money. And we don't talk about hardly any of those in church anymore, right? Because we might offend you. And if we offend you, then you're gonna get upset, you're gonna leave, and you may not come back, right? And that, that, that really is a powerful impetus to my pastor colleagues. We want you to feel good about yourself, have a good vibe, a good feeling, so that you can come back the next week. Listen, my, my desire is when I die, and I stand before God, I wanna be able to say, God, I gave them the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth, and they are accountable to you. That's, that's my job. That's my primary responsibility. So ask and say, Lord, I recognize everything is a gift from you. Number two, ask God to help you. Say, God, I am deficient in this area. Lord, I need help with my anger. I need help with my unforgiveness. God, I need help with my idolatry. I need help, God, with my pornography. God, I need help with my robbing you. Malachi 3.8 says, will a man rob God? Yet you say, no way, we have not robbed. In what way have we robbed God? In your tithes and in your offerings. Is that? that behind me? Okay, say, God, I'm sorry. I'm a thief. I have robbed from you, and I'm gonna ask you to forgive me. Number three, start small and then grow. Now, some of y'all gonna disagree with me on this, and that's okay. Um, people say, you need to tell them to tithe. Start tithing right now. Tithe, tithe, tithe. And I, I believe you should tithe as a bare minimum but if you ain't given nothing, why don't you say, God, we're gonna do a percent. <laughs> we're, we're, gonna, we're gonna start with a percent or, or 2%. Of course, I'd love for you to, to grow in that and to mature in your faith. And, and, but I would say start somewhere and then just watch what God does. I mean, God loves it when you give. He loves when you're a cheerful giver. Start small and grow. Number four, learn from others on how to be a good steward. Uh, we offer classes here at Great Hills, Dave Ramsey's Financial Peace. We have people in our church who know what tithing is and they are so blessed and they would be happy to share with you how to make a budget, how do you tithe, how do you pull apart 10% and give it to the Lord and to his work and um, that, would be, that would be cool. That would be really cool. If some in our church, David, maybe some of our elderly or some of our 
folks would come to David and say, David, the pastor talked about helping people with their finances. I can do that. I can help people with a budget. I can help people show them how God will richly bless them as they tithe. And the fifth one is this. This is very practical, but I want to encourage you with this. Commit to live within your means. Many people in our country live way beyond their means. Let me give you an example. And my brother and I were talking about this the other day, and he's really smart, he's really good with his money. And he said, you know, the average person who makes $150,000 a year in America has zero money for a crisis. They have no savings account. And so when something happens in their home, they have to go borrow the money, even though they make this very large salary of $150,000 a year. You know why? Because they live beyond their means. If you make $50,000 a year and you live as if you make $75,000 a year, here's what's gonna happen. You're gonna get in trouble. And you are going to get in debt and you and your honey are not gonna be sweet lovey-dovey for long because y'all gonna start fussing and fighting, right? You're gonna go, what? You're gonna be at each other's, at each other's throat going, what is going on in this money situation? And I, I would say, are you living within your means and are you giving your tithes and your offerings, Okay. Commit to live within your means. Like no, live like nobody does today so that you can live like nobody does in the future. Y'all all right? Does that make sense? I think that's Dave Ramsey. Live like very, very, it would shock you in this room right here, right now. How many of y'all tithe? Very few hands would go up. Some of y'all are like, whoo, good. I'm not the only sinner in the house, you know it. Ooh, that makes me feel good. That's not, that's not good, y'all. I'm, I'm not saying that to brag on you. I mean, that's, not, that's not healthy. Live like nobody lives today. Within your means, give your tithes and your offerings. Watch this. So that when you get a little bit older, you'll live like nobody lives. You'll have more money you know what to do with. You'll be able to bless others. You know why? Because you started small, you grew into it, you were a channel of God's blessings, a conduit, and just watch what he does. Let me finish this paragraph, because in my notes it says, read this. I'm reading it. Live like nobody does today, so you can live like nobody does in the future. Delayed gratification is a wonderful principle and leads to a blessed life. A principle the devil does not want you to know about for he knows it will radically change your life for the better if you can delay your gratification and say, Lord, I'm gonna live within my means. I'm gonna be generous. I wanna give to you, God. That's what Ashley and I do. I mean, we, we, we give and then some because we, we know everything we have is a gift from God. And some of you are like, well, I don't have the spiritual gift of, of giving. And therefore, I'm gonna be stingy and, and I'm just not gonna give. No, it doesn't work like that. Well, I don't have the spiritual gift of evangelism, so I'm not gonna witness. Really? It doesn't work like that. So God has blessed us and he wants us to be generous. So come harvest offering, here's what I'm hoping will happen. I'm hoping between now and four weeks from now, the Holy Spirit will really start working on your heart. Some of y'all are beyond mad, okay? You're, you're you're red, you're like red in your face and you're, you're, just, you're just getting angry. And you're really not angry with me, you're angry at God. Because God's, if, if I preach this sermon, have I been unbiblical in any way? Would somebody rise up and say, you have been unbiblical, you have misquoted the Bible? Anybody? Maybe the Holy Spirit is speaking to you and he's testing you to see if you will step out in, in faith and do this. Matthew 6, 21, Jesus said, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. I wonder if the Lord has our heart today. If God has your heart, I'm reminded of the, I don't know, Sam, I think it was Sam Houston when he got baptized. Y'all remember him, right? Houston, Texas, right there. I think it was Sam Houston said, he got saved as an adult. And oh, I, need to, I need to check my facts on this. I think this is right. I read his biography many years ago, but he, it was him or he was telling the preacher, and I want to get baptized with my wallet in my pocket because I want to give it all to God. Some of y'all get baptized, you're like, 
take me under. Here's my wallet, but don't, don't, don't get that. Please don't take that, because that's my idol. That's my idol. And if I don't look out for me, who in the world are going to look out for me? Jesus will. Jesus will. Woo! We did it. Yay! We did it. Hey, so the next time you rascal come up to me and say, never preach on money, I'm going to say, you're wrong. And if you got the looks I got today, you would never preach on money either. So, bless you. Would you trust God? Would you trust him? And just see, see what he does. Judy Stone, did I quote you correctly? I never regret anything that I've given to the Lord. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the hard parts. <laughs> thank you, Lord, for that word you said, Jesus. And it really, it really shakes me up every time I read it. If I can't trust you with money, how am I gonna trust you with eternal riches. Lord, I know a message like this is troubling and I certainly run the risk of offending people, Lord, and they're gonna find them another church. But Lord, I, I do pray as they, as they make their way out and maybe as they go to that other church that God, you'd put it on their heart that this is your heart for them, this is your will for them to be generous, to be gracious in their lifestyle, Lord, not just in their tithes, but in their offerings and in their kindness. Lord, may we be quick to give praise and may we be generous with our affections and may we uh, seek service opportunities. Lord, it's not just money, it's the gifts that you've given us. Lord, I know not everybody needs to be singing in that choir. They just can't do it. They, it it's not good for them. It's not good for us. But Lord, there are some people that need to be singing. There are people, God, you have blessed and we're just like sitting on these gifts and these talents. And Lord, the blessed life is the life where we give. And I'm praying, God, that you would just incorporate this, this generosity principle and lifestyle in, in our hearts. Even as we leave the church today, God, that may it ring clear, clearly, loudly in our hearts and our ears that I want to be a person who blesses others. Lord, thank you for Jesus. We didn't just give some. But Jesus, you gave it all. You gave everything away. You gave your very life on the cross so that we could be saved and redeemed and that we could be sanctified and that we could live a life like nobody else lives so that glory to God, we will live in heaven with you. We're praying now, Lord, that you would take the message that was preached today and Holy Spirit, I pray that you would emblazon it, tattoo it, Lord, upon their hearts, upon their minds, sear it, Lord, upon their consciences. And God, they would see that, Lord, you're not just joking around. You're not yanking their chain. This is, this is big stuff. That, Lord, we could be faithful in the little. And then, Lord, you'll entrust us to be faithful with the much. I want to pray for you. But before I pray for you, church family, I, I, I want to extend this, this offering, this invitation to you. Before God ever wants what's yours, God always wants you. He wants your heart. He wants your affection and your devotion. And when you give that to him, genuinely give that to him, then Brother Danny does not have to talk you into getting baptized, right? <laughs> because it's very biblical and that's what you should do. Brother Danny does not need to preach sermons on sermons about being forgiving, for being a forgiving individual. No, that's very, very biblical. And I really shouldn't have to talk about tithing and giving offerings. Why? Because God got your heart. And when God really has your heart, then he's got all of you. And here's the thing. God says, watch this. Watch what I do. Watch me dispense the resources of heaven into your life simply because you're gonna trust in me. Test me now in this and see if I will not bless your socks off. God, I just thank you. And I just pray that people be saved today, God. I, Lord, there, there are people listening online and people in this room right here, right now. Lord, their heart is hard. The 
The Holy Spirit's not in their heart. And I'm praying this would be a day of salvation. Wouldn't it be awesome? Your testimony would be, the pastor preached a sermon on giving, and I gave my heart to Jesus. Wouldn't that be awesome? Give your heart to Jesus. I invite you to do that right here, right now. Father, I pray in Jesus' name for salvation to flow from heaven, from your heart, into the very hearts of people right here, right now. Hearts that are broken, hearts that are repentant, and hearts that are believing. And I pray for you, Great Hills Baptist Church. I thank you. You are, so many of you are incredibly generous. And I'm just, my wife thanks you. Our staff thanks you. We exist. That's how we live because of your generosity. And I cannot thank you enough. And may God bless you. May God continue to pour out his favor upon you as you bless others. Maybe you're here today and you're praying about it saying, you know what? I, I think this is the church for me. Instead of getting offended and mad, I actually, I, I got convicted, and now I'm glad. I think this is probably the place I need to link my life. This is not a prosperity gospel church. This is not an overly seeker-sensitive church. This is a Bible-teaching, Bible-believing church of generosity. Come on, honey. This is where we need to be. Lord, I'm praying that conversation would happen many, many times over and over. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.